This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show. Today on the James Altucher Show. No one, in my view, no one is going to have on their tombstone during the great pandemic of, of the novel coronavirus, he overreacted. So far, no one can be accused of overreacting. The only the only negative attribute, I think, in response will be that thus far is that we underreacted. The, the way I would best summarize our viewpoint as Americans right now, or at least the viewpoints I'm taking, is that if the species gets wiped out, that's bad, but would be even worse is if the NASDAQ goes down. Could it be the case that there's so much quick destruction that we're left with people just on the street expe- expecting the next UBI bill, the next stimulus bill to get passed, and we don't know what to do with these 40 million workers? Like, is there a point of no return if we keep this economy shut down long enough? I don't think so. I, I, you know, I might be naive, but my sense is the terrible thing about crises is they always happen, but the wonderful thing is they always end. And I think we've faced much bigger tasks. Like what? Well, I don't think about I don't think about us personally because the reality is we have lived a charmed life. Uh, at least I have. But I think you know I'm an atheist, but I, I say I have gods, and that is when I'm ever feeling sorry for myself, which is one of the things i hate about myself um uh, my god is my my uh, maternal grandfather who i never met norman levine who used to escort his four daughters and son to a makeshift bomb shelter in the london tube in 1943 because their house had been destroyed during a bomb raid during the panic his oldest daughter at 11 was run over by a truck now i'm sitting here pissed off and upset and feeling sorry for myself and the reality is if we demonstrate a fraction of the resilience and the leadership that our grandparents demonstrated, we're going to be just fine. I hope you're right. But, oh yeah, we'll definitely be back. There's nothing wrong with America that can't be fixed with what's right with America. Scott Galloway, you've been on the podcast twice before. Algebra of Happiness, you're the author of, great book. Also, a great book uh, that you wrote earlier than that, The Four, The Hidden DNA of Amazon, Facebook, Google, and... One other company that I'm forgetting Apple, right now. Apple, James. Jesus Christ. Apple. Sheltering in place, taking too much sativa, not enough coffee. I'm, Come on, my man. I'm losing IQ points every single day. Come I'm on. I'm, I'm in on. place. It's a big bank there. You're lucky. There's a big bank. <laughs> so so uh, how's it how's it going? Uh, well, like everyone else, it's sort of I don't you know none of us have been through anything like this. So it's a mix of feeling blessed because you get perspective in times like this and. Uh, interrupted by moments of kind of sheer sort of, I wouldn't call it panic, but just trying to wrap your head and your arms around this. And also greater empathy for those housewives who get in the car, load up all their kids in a minivan, and then drive everyone into a lake. I kind of get it now. I kind of get it. Um, I, I'm thinking about a minivan. The kids, my kids are, it's as if Iraqi insurgents took control of our household. The <laughs> sheltering in place with children is just, is, is not easy. Not easy. But well, anyways, I, I have five I'm fine. kids. Two, two of my kids are with me. Three of my kids are scattered around the world, and uh, so yeah, it's a weird, it's a weird time for everyone. I mean, why did you leave New York City for for during this time? So I closed the office about three and a half weeks ago. Like I guess on the arc of things, sort of early. I was one of those guys who got it all wrong very early, and then pivoted. Pretty quickly, I closed the office uh, three weeks and three days ago, told everyone to go home, and I went to being the neurotic person I am. I put together a matrix of all the places in the world that had low levels of outbreak, a decent hospital, a low-density resort we could stay at because I had this very unfortunate situation where my wife and kids were living with my in-laws because we're in between houses, which is obviously an unacceptable situation of all potentially these asymptomat- asymptomatic carriers going in and out of a seven-year-old couple's house. So I did this matrix, low-density resort, heat, and I came up with the Riviera Maya. So I went, came down three weeks ago, grabbed my wife and kids, and took them to the Maya Coba in Mexico. And we were there until last Friday. The call to come home, even though Florida doesn't make a lot of sense on a lot of levels right now, but the call to get back home is pretty strong. So we came home exactly a week ago, and now we're here sheltering in place at friends who are sheltering in place in Montana. So we have this, we're in a strange house, and I'm sitting in a 14-year-old girl's room right now. How about you? Where are you, and why are you there? 
I'm in New York City, and we debated leaving New York City because, uh, you know, you wrote you wrote a really good. I I really liked how you structured a recent one of your articles, which was kind of um looking at your life via the prism of these cataclysmic events like 1987, 9 11, financial crisis, uh, this virus. And I, I debated leaving New York City because I'm kind of sick of being at ground zero for every major yeah. crisis. <laughs> like I was I was at the World Trade Center on 9-11. Yeah. I, was, I lived on Wall Street during the financial crisis. Like my actual apartment was on Wall Street and I was on CNBC all the time talking about the crisis. And now here we are in New York City again, which is supposedly the epicenter of world deaths now in yeah. this virus. And it's getting a little bit tiring to always be at ground zero. And I'm wondering if, being outside of New York City reduced stress for you. You know what? The, the, everyone reacts differently, but New York was feeling very uh, uncomfortable to me. And that is back three and a half weeks ago, which seems like a lifetime ago, when you walked around New York, it was starting to get more sparse. So you knew something was wrong. But at the same time, it was still crowded. So you were worried you could be infected. So it was the worst of both worlds. It was, yeah. it was quiet enough to know something was not normal, but not, not, not sheltering in place such that people weren't, you know, we weren't in the kind of first 15 minutes of the movie of contagion. In addition, uh, there's something about when you get off a plane and it's 75 or 80 degrees, you just feel safer. At least I do. And so the warm weather, I think that's why old people move to Florida and Texas. There's something about warmth that just feels inherently healthier and safer. So a mix of the vanilla sky, like, scenario in New York, plus the cold, uh, New York to me felt very uncomfortable. And I told all my, all the kids who work with me, and I say kids, cause the average age is kind of 24, 26, you know, to get out and get, get to your parents. I, I think New York is not a very appealing place to be right now. I feel it, it feels dystopic to me. What do you think? Yeah, I think, and I, I think dystopic in part because of the, the, uh, you know, right now, I saw some statistic that basically on the streets, there are 86% fewer people. So let's say instead of being, instead of seeing 20 people on your block a few weeks ago, you might see two people. And even that might be large. Like usually you don't see any people now on a, on a given block, but Central Park itself is crowded because it's easier to be outside uh, in the sun and still be six feet away from, or 10 feet away from all the other people. And but even then, you walk around Central Park and you just stumble upon uh, a whole, you know, like a dozen tent hospitals that have been set up yeah. in the middle of the park. And and everybody here, because they're so attached to what's going on, everybody here is basically depressed. Like there's this and, and every store is closed. Now, you can't tell always if a store is closed because it's forced to be closed or many businesses now are just simply out of business. Like yeah. in the past three weeks. I mean, I'm a, I'm a, in addition to, you know, the other things I do and, and so on, I also am a small business owner in the community. I own a yeah. bar slash comedy club. And yeah. so I'm, I'm kind of in touch with things going on there. And essentially every bar and restaurant right now in New York city is out of business, even chains. Yeah. And that'll reverse itself because of these SBA loans are, are very friendly towards restaurants and, and exactly yeah. these sorts of businesses. So that's going to completely reverse Although we'll see, there's there's unintended consequences of all good intentions, and and I and I can already see there's going to be some unintended consequences of the good intentions of of these SBA SBA loans for small businesses, but uh, you know, which is in part what we're here to talk about the new normal. But I also want to th ask you. I mean, there's a lot of a lot there's a lot of misinformation and a lot of people who just simply don't know. Uh, what's happening with this virus. And I just want to see where we are in terms of, are, are, are we on the same page? Are we different? Like there's the one group of people that I feel don't know as much and think that we're going to be in quarantine and lockdown for the next 18 months until there's a vaccine, which I think is ridiculous. And then there's another group that thinks, uh, let's say at the other extreme, that we need to reopen the economy immediately, or at least after we hit a peak in the viruses, but maybe not necessarily before we contain or control it. Uh, where where are you on that? Where do you see the virus going first? And then it's interesting because that's going to affect how we discuss the, the potential new normal. Yeah, it seems as if everyone, it seems as if people are having their own pandemic and that, that largely speaking, the pandemic bifurcates into two different types of RNA viruses. And that's the one 
we're experiencing if you're watching CNN and the New York Times, which is effectively the world is coming to an end. And then there's the one if you listen to lieutenant governors from red states and Fox, which says stop by the pub on your way back to work. <laughs> and so well, why, do you say, why do you say lieutenant governors instead of governors? Well, Daniel Patrick, this this I'll affectionately call him total ass clown from Texas, making this moral argument that people over the age of 70 should get back to work as soon as possible to ensure there's an economic future for their children. I just thought that was one of the most irresponsible comments made so far in this crisis. Like where I am is the following. Uh, I take comfort in the fact that if we were to all successfully distance six feet for 14 days, you'd likely put a uh, stake through the heart of this thing. And one of the reasons right. I, I got out of New York is that I do believe New Yorkers have a responsibility now to especially safe distance because the healthcare system there is on the verge or has been overrun. And so you not only put yourself at risk, but you put others at risk when, you know, if you're not incredibly vigilant in New York. Now, having said that, I, it seems to me pretty simple that the ones that were the most disciplined and people called, you know, people, it, what I would call mild racism, call Asian cultures compliant, that somehow our irresponsibility, our inability to recognize something we had a heads up on, our inability to apply, quote unquote, innovation that we we boast about, our inability to apply what is the greatest, greatest asset allocation in history across healthcare doesn't seem to have helped the United States. We're now the center. We now have more infections than China, Italy, and Spain combined. We saw it. We had more time to prepare than them. And we like to think that, quite frankly, we like to think American exceptionalism would come to bear here. American exceptionalism, in this case, has been a level of narcissism. Oh, the Chinese are, are an inferior people and that those weird, gross, disgusting things don't, don't come here. A place like South Korea, they call it compliance, not competence. They've demonstrated competence in South Korea. And then Italy's all fucked up and they'll, that they kind of deserve it because, you know, those crazy Italians, they kiss each other, other and their governments are incompetent. But if you look at our curve relative to where Italy was at the same point, Italy actually handled this better than we did. So, you know, I take comfort in the fact that if, if and when, and I do think we're getting there, places like San Francisco and Washington are being smart about this and really attacking it, that the curve is going to flatten and life will get back to not a normal, but a new normal. And we're going to be right out again. We're going to be hugging and kissing again, and we're going to be spending times with our loved ones. And even if we decided it wasn't good, at some point, people are going to decide they just are going to take those risks. My in-laws called us today and said, when can we come over and see the kids? And we said, not for a while. But at some point, they're just going to start showing up at the door. So, well, well, you know, let me, let me ask you this, though. Ahead. Like in New York City, for instance, we've been uh, on, you know, lockdown slash all the businesses are closed slash, you know, strong social distancing guidelines. Yep. For, I don't know, like 20 days maybe. And, uh, you know, that's essentially two infection cycles, meaning someone get infected and usually they show severe enough symptoms to go show up at the hospital 10 to 12 days later. So it should, and we're right now, because we've been through th th this times and we have somewhat effectively social distance, yep. hospitalizations every day do get lower and lower in New York City. Like it's unlikely like all the models that have predicted enormous hospitalizations in New York City are now about 80 to 90 percent off, uh, including the model they use in the White House to, to figure these things out. And so it could be the case that, you know, within the next week or so, we'll see, you know, in the next within the next week, we should have noticed that New York City has peaked. I'd be surprised if it well, didn't. they're saying that you're reading the same stuff I am. They're saying the peak is supposed to be in six to seven days. Yeah, or even or USC, which has been um, there's a group, a research group at USC has been modeling the exponential curves in all the other places, yeah. like essentially how long things double before exponential growth flattens out. And yep. we've already we're, we're passing that point. Actually, today is the is the, the day they predicted for the peak. Who knows? And then I, I and just based on all the other cities, you know, maybe April 15th, give or take a week for the whole US. But peak doesn't mean the end It might mean the end is in June then uh, or, or who knows? But uh, so do you see some time between peak, meaning the exponential growth is over and cases are starting to subside? Do you think at, at that point or, or near that point, we start to, quote unquote, get back to work, maybe state by state or demographic by demographic? Or do you think the U.S. will wait till the very end of, of what's considered, like, you know, kind of like how Wuhan did? You know, I don't I don't know what what I find frightening is or what I what I think is true is I do think that this is a monster. And if Dracula came into town and started killing people and then we injured it, and that's the metaphor I would use right now. We have, I think America and certain cities have been 
better than others, but generally speaking, there is a, a nationwide response to this. And if he was injured and leaving town, we wouldn't say, well, let's wait till he comes back. We'd hunt him down and put a stake through his fucking heart. And my sense is this notion that certain cities should get back to work and others shouldn't. It seems to me that this thing doesn't know any borders and will end up in probably at least every major city to a certain extent. And that it just seems that the vigilance here is no one, in my view, no one is going to get no one is going to have on their tombstone during the great pandemic of, of the novel coronavirus, he overreacted. So far, no one can be accused of overreacting. The only, the only kind of negative, uh, the only negative attribute, I think, in response will be that thus far that we is amongst uh, leaders, amongst citizens, amongst sons, spouses, whatever you want to call it, is that we underreacted. Now, is that to say that at some point it probably d- doesn't mean we shouldn't get back to work? No, but this idea that we're going to have A, B, and C cities and fire up certain places, it's the, the way I would best summarize our viewpoint as Americans right now, or at least the viewpoints I'm taking, is that if the species gets wiped out, that's bad, but would be even worse is if the NASDAQ goes down. And <laughs> I find it just strange that, you know, in Europe, there's less of a sense of panic, I think. Because the bailout packages have mostly been around ensuring people have 60, 80, 90% of their previous salaries. And so there's not as much of a panic among the populace. Whereas in the US, there, you know, the, not the majority, but say half the bailout, I think, is for loans and small business. And I'm a fan of that because I'm a small business person. But we have a much different approach. We're, we're much more focused on the economy. Maybe that's smart. Uh, maybe it isn't, but my sense is the way we go after this thing is just to just to distance like crazy in a very vigilant and hopefully very short time. But I take heart in what you say. I think I th- I agree. It looks as if the curve is flattening across the different places. The scary part, James, will be in in September when I'm asked to return to class and I'm supposed to have 170 kids sitting elbow to elbow, and we start to feel like getting start to feel like getting cold again. Which I think not only psychologically, but also there's some evidence that the virus doesn't like heat, but when it starts to get cold again and there's a relapse in certain areas, or uh, that's when I think it'll be get even more scary because I think people will feel so fatigued and a head fake back to normalcy if it gets ruined by a relapse would be exceptionally damaging to the psyche and to the economy. So in some, you know, I'm not an epidemiologist, but my sense is we take a lot of medicine right now. We're paranoid. We're weird. I'm trying to be exceptionally vigilant right now and, you know, not even are trying not to let kids come over and play with my kids and stuff like that because we don't know the extent to that they can be asymptomatic carriers. But look, everybody, what's, what's disappointing here is typically when aliens invade, we'd all unite, as Reagan said, or we all knew that the Nazis were our common enemy. When the person next to you becomes the enemy, as it does in a pandemic, we all have a different reaction. And it doesn't feel as if there's a unified global reaction to this. We, we have this fetishization of local decision making. So we have these Joey Bag of Donuts, health health agencies across states, there's still seven or nine states that haven't gone to a lockdown and they happen to all be red state governors. And so it's just disappointing that this comity of man or a unified collective response we can't figure out in a time of crisis. And it's it's largely instinctive. An enemy comes over the hill, the guy next to you is your ally. And in a pandemic, the guy next to you is your enemy. So And, and so what do you think ahead. of the the messaging of the let's say the president using you know this this rhetoric of uh you know we're at war against a common enemy this invisible enemy do you think that's unifying or do you think just people are so polarized like like on on the one hand you know it's hard to i I think you might have said it's hard to cast blame you know one way or the other on the other hand i sort of feel like everything's still so partisan that democrats believe one thing about the coronavirus republicans Right. believe another thing about the coronavirus and it's disturbing when partisanship um uh, you know governs policy that affects the lives of billions so for instance if someone mentions chloroquine hey it's a, an approved F- fda drug might be worth trying and but you know everybody on the other side says no it's not you know and, and i'm just using that as an example there's like a dozen decisions like that i get i get disturbed about that, that and that's probably why we can't have a cohesive nationwide policy against this yeah i think you're absolutely right so it feels as if cnn sees the pandemic as an opportunity to to highlight the the president's deficiencies and fox sees themselves as state tv that's there just to adopt the talking points of the president and there's nothing there's nothing going down the middle saying i mean i i yeah i'm not i'm not a huge fan of the president's 
president, I have a bias towards him, but I think the, the, the war footing they've gone on in the last, what I'll call five or seven days is, is a good footing to me. I think they're saying the right things finally. Now, the problem is, it, it just seems to me it was late. And the majority, if you look at the majority of leadership across crises, the U.S. public wants sober data and then a vision for how we get out. What was, what was kind of the, the communication strategy here was they didn't really acknowledge the problem for a while. It was, this is going to yeah. disappear. It's not as bad as we think. You know, there was this constant kind of slow balling uh, and this sort of glossing over, rubbing, rubbing Vaseline over the lens of the virus. And now they've pivoted to, well, we knew this was coming. We just wanted to be optimistic. And it could have been a lot worse. It looks like it's only going to be between 100 and 250,000 deaths, but it could have been a lot worse. So I think they're on, I don't want to say they're on the right footing right now, but I think their communication strategy has gotten a lot better. But I just don't think there's any getting around it. I think the president is going to come out of this deeply damaged. His approval rating is 48%. And people say, well, that's not bad. But if you look at George W., if you look at W's approval rating after 9-11, it was, it was 93%. Even the Argentinian government, the junta government or the military government that was very unpopular in the 80s, their popularity screamed upwards when they decided to repatriate those all-important assets called the Falkland Islands. So in a time of crisis, people have a tendency to rally around their leaders and the flag. But the fact they've only rallied to about 48% either reflects that our partisan divide is just so entrenched we can't get there or that people on the whole don't don't approve of the president's handling this, uh, handling of this. But even deeper than that, just as a nation, you know, we, we really have to look in the mirror here. I think there was some narcissism that was damaging for us. I think uh, our, our notion of us being so innovative, yet yet we can't seem to figure out things like ventilators and the distribution of protective equipment. I think we're just going to have to take a hard look in the mirror here around what what we exactly we mean by American exceptionalism. What do you mean? Well, I think that if I think there was a general feeling that this wasn't going to come here, that we're better than those those backward countries that have wet markets, that we can handle this and that our healthcare system is the best in the world, that we won't have this same sort of damage or collateral damage. And I think if you'd said, will America have a tough time figuring out a way to get enough ventilators up and running? We would have said, of course not. We make electric cars and smartphones and photo, photo sharing apps that two and a half billion people use. I think that our response here around just general technology and the distribution of that technology hasn't been what I'd call robust or reflective of the most innovative, what is supposed to be the most innovative supply chain and and technologically sophisticated economy in the world. It just it doesn't feel as if I don't know. I don't. I don't think our marks here are going to be that strong. Whether you look at the slope of the curve, the infection rates, and we sort of knew this was coming. At first, it hit Asia, then it hit Europe. So you'd like to think that we would have been a little bit more prepared. So I think a mix of narcissism, a cold comfort around how innovative we are, and I just think I, I don't think the administration or leadership here has been very coordinated. Uh, they've been giving V-Day speeches instead of D-Day speeches. Uh, and I think that has hurt us. I think the footing they're on most recently is helpful. But I think in in, in retrospect, when we look uh, back on how we handled this, we're not going to feel very good about it. I, I agree with you. And I think I think also there's going to be uh, – and then, of course, we're, we're, we're tangenting a little bit from the, the discussion of the new normal, but this is important also – I think we're going to look back and like you say, not only is there the narcissism of America, which is built up over 200 years of frontier thinking, but uh, there's also this increasing partisanship. I, I sort of feel like, and this is totally a tangent, but I sort of feel like in, I missed 2012 because in 2012, you had Obama versus Romney in the election. And mm-hmm. I felt like you could reasonably say both are intelligent people. You might not like issues from one or the other, but there was like a real debate of ideas and how you want a country to move forward. And there wasn't sort of this disdain and disgust for people on the other side. And right now, everything is so polarized. Like I consider myself left of center, but I feel like people who are for, you know, kind of mainstream now further from center view me almost as fascist, even though I've been, you know, left my entire life. And I think that's going to be an analysis, part of the analysis of this as well. But given all that, given that we have this stimulus package in, which is, I it, I don't think it should be called a stimulus package. I think it should be called a band aid because you still need to resuscitate 
the uh, the pa- you can't stimulate a dead patient, so you have to resuscitate the patient at some point. Uh, and maybe this pushed back the point where we need to resuscitate. It doesn't have to be early April. Maybe it could be early May. It could, maybe it could be early June because it's not as if people are spending are eager to spend so much money right now. You could kind of keep things somewhat on pause. Maybe, although maybe many businesses will go out of business. What happens next? How uh, we, you've discussed a little bit the new normal on on your your blog and so on. Uh, I've thought about this. I'm, I'm just curious about what's What's next? How do we get out of this? So the honest answer is I, I don't know. I, I can speculate. Gen- generally speaking, uh, this is worse for the economy than coming out of war. And there's a few things. If you look at the majority of the great pandemics, or whether it's a Black Plague or the Spanish flu, and that is when you come out of a war, there's a shared sense of victory and optimism. We won. And you go in and everyone unites and says, all right, we know the way forward because we're the victors. We're going to rebuild. There's a Marshall Plan. Our enemies become our allies. There's a unified vision because one party won. And we know what to do. We know to rebuild Berlin and Tokyo. And there's we all sort of willingly or unwillingly kind of join hands. In a pandemic, there's generally a lack of optimism. It's more like, okay, we fucked up. The reason why people don't talk about the Spanish flu that killed so many people in America is we're ashamed of our response. We became very feral. We became, we hoarded. The, we were, our healthcare system was overrun. There were people dying on the streets. So we just don't talk about it a lot because we're sort of ashamed. And generally speaking, both wars and pandemics favor capital over, I'm sorry, favor labor over capital. And you're already seeing that now. Like the, a lot of people are, are evaluating these buyout packages or these bailout packages by are people getting paid not to work? And also the people who are working are flexing their muscles and showing power. And as you see, a lot of these workers are going on strikes and highlighting how badly labor has had the shit kicked out of them in the last 30 years when people are forced to go to work so they can make nine bucks an hour. So generally speaking, there's a rebalancing back to labor from capital. But from an investment standpoint or a capital standpoint or a stock market standpoint, it's just terrible because there's you don't come out of it with a sense of optimism or unified vision. Labor labor wins, which might might be a good thing here. It's time we needed a, a rebalance. Typically, when you get to the levels of income inequality we have, they self correct with war, famine, or revolution. And you would argue this is a form of famine or pestilence. But the stock market, economically, um, I mean, just look at my industry. I don't think I don't think universities in California. Louisiana and New York are going to open again in the fall. I just can't imagine we're going to decide, even if the virus just disappears in New York, I can't imagine we're going to decide that, Scott, you should take, you should have 170 people sitting elbow to elbow starting August 28th in New York. Nobody wants to be, the more progressive you are, the more fearful you are right now. And nobody wants to be the relapse, the Wuhan of relapse in New York. And NYU and any university on the coast, the pandemic we're having is that we believe the smart thing to do is to overreact. So I can't imagine we're going to make a conscious decision to open again. And when you see universities not open in the fall, the top schools with decent endowments and decent brands like NYU, like Columbia, they're going to be fine. They're going to be much less financially strong. But you're going to see hundreds of universities that are largely dependent upon their tuition payments just go away. They're going to close up in fall and they're never going to reopen. Well, and and not only the economics of it, and and so this is kind of the chapter one of the normal is how this is affecting education. And I think there's going to be s- some new business models as a result. But it's not only the fact that uh, economically they m- it might not be viable for many to open, but let's not forget all these kids paid you know sixty seventy thousand a year tuition, yeah. and schools at the beginning of this semester, colleges at the beginning of this semester, basically told kids, oh, you know what. That whole seventy thousand dollars you just paid into to come to our campus and learn from our professors, we were sort of kidding a little bit. It's just it's good enough if you go at home and and learn online uh, remotely from your parents' house. And I think that changes how people are going to view colleges, maybe appropriately. I'm sort of of the view that remote learning mixed with real world life experience is probably better for kids, but who knows. And I just think, though, this is going to question the 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 fact that tuition has risen every single year versus inflation uh, for the past fifty years. Is people are now reminded of that in a way, in a brutal way, and they might look for alternatives. 
You're, you're absolutely right. You said a lot there. So <clears throat> the tuition at NYU, I think it's like 68 grand. But if you come on campus, you go see Spike Lee speak during lunchtime. You play Ultimate Frisbee in Washington Square Park. You party in the dorms. You have your heart broken. You have sex for the first time. You go to your, your friend's football game, not at NYU, but at Penn. And you call home and say, mom, dad, I'm learning a lot. I'm loving it. I'm maturing. I'm seasoning. You know, that is sort of worth it. And what you're having across all levels of education now on Zoom, even at, at, in, in pre-K, even on pre-K, even sec, uh, basic education, all over, the, all over America, people who are spending twenty, thirty, fifty, eight thousand dollars $58,000 a year if you send your kids to Grace Church are listening in on their third grader Zoom call and go, going, this is totally insufficient. If I'm paying 58 grand to have this happen over the next year, there's just no way I'm going to do that. The sad part about education is that there'll be good and bad. I think big tech is going to enter. I think Google's going to partner with an MIT and say, all right, now that we're no longer bound by physical space or geography, we're not going to welcome 3,000 kids to campus. We're going to welcome 30 or 300. And we'll do it in two or three years. And instead of charging a quarter of a million in tuition, we'll charge 25 or 50 grand which will be a great deal. It'll expand education. It'll expand learning. But the traditional four-year kind of human experience of discovery and campus and football games and fall leaves, and I rode crew at UCLA, I played sports, that is going to become even more unattainable for the middle class. There just won't be many kids like myself who come from the household of a single mother as a secretary that'll get to share in that very humane experience. So what we'll end up with, I think, is we'll end up with a small number of academics who are world class and earning three to ty- 10 times the money. You'll have some administrators who have product management skills doing better. Everyone else in academia will make a lot less money. We're going to see an expansion of learning and vocational via new technologies such that a lot more people, quote unquote, learn. But it'll erode our humanity in the sense that a lot of kids are no longer going to have access to that incredibly joyous, self-awareness experience called the traditional college experience. I think it's going to go away for a lot of people. I I agree with that. And um, I don't necessarily, I mean, it's not like kids, if they don't go to college are not going to have friends and have their heart broken and have sex for the first time between the ages of 18 and 22. Like all of that will still happen. It'll just happen in a different context. Like maybe there's two or three hours in the morning where they do their online education, you know, within the Google MIT program or in LinkedIn Learning or in Coursera. Uh, I like your comment about masterclass in your blog post that who wants to take classes from celebrities. But uh, I, I do think some kind of online learning is sufficient to match the college learning, uh, particularly uh, per dollar. And then the, I, I kind of think kids find their 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 real world experiences regardless of whether we send them away to college or or they're out in the real world doing things? I think there's, there's going to be some upside. There's going to be more opportunity for more kids to learn skills, to be competitive in our economy. But I mean, I'll give you an example. I, I, was, I, I was in a fraternity and people say a oh, fraternity, that means you're a white jerk or whatever, an elitist. I, there were really wealthy kids in the fraternity. There were really kids who, were, who came from economically disadvantaged backgrounds. There were kids that There were kids that were gay. There were kids that were closeted and gay. And then there were heterosexual. You developed a sense of exposure, living with people and interacting with them and experiencing these things with them and touching them in in large groups all rallied around some general notion of learning in a safe, joyous place. I think there's a level of growth there. I think there's a level of empathy you develop. There's a sense of, and I'm just being nostalgic, just pure joyousness that is really, and again, I might be just being nos- nostalgic here, that is really a tragedy if we, if we, if a lot of middle-class kids no longer have access to that, if it becomes the ultimate luxury item, unless you're a kid out of the Gulf or from Oman or from rich parents' households, that that experience is no longer an American experience available to a lot of people. So I think some wonderful things are hap- will happen, but that type of growth and empathy that you establish and that appreciation for, I'm worried that liberal arts will go away. I wouldn't have taken psych. If I was just taking online courses, trying to figure out a way to make a living, I would have never taken psych. I would have never taken Ellingtonia, the history of Duke Ellington. I mean, maybe I shouldn't. Maybe that shit's just waste, wasteful and we're no longer in an era where we can afford that. But if, if big tech comes in, and it will, 
you'll have a, a deflation and an expansion of education, which is a good thing. You'll have millions yes. and tens of millions of people learning. That's a good thing, just as more people have a smartphone in their pocket or have access to more information via Google. You'll have the majority of, uh, you'll have a, an absolutely uh, vanquishing of hundreds of thousands of academic jobs. Couldn't happen to a nicer group of people. We've stuck our chin out. I work with one of the best faculties in the world. A third of them should be put on an ice flow. Not only are they expensive, but as they become more uh, less relevant, they get angry and become ex- obstructionist and have a viewpoint and opinion simply because they're tr- they're desperately barking for relevance. So couldn't happen to a nicer group of people. The problem is, is that at, uh, what you'll have is a tremendous increase in stakeholder value that will go to disturbingly few organizations and people in terms of in terms of actual monetary stakeholder increase. And we'll also, just like as big tech has sort of overrun different things, I think there'll just be a loss of humanity and joy around the thing. So it'll be a series of trade-offs. We're about to get wildly disrupted in higher ed. We have asked for it. We've raised our prices faster than inflation, as, you, as you've pointed out. There are now textbooks that are eight or $900 because we can, right. because we have these duopolies. Every city has a duopoly. There's NYU, there's Columbia, there's UCLA, there's USC, there's Berkeley, there's Stanford. Now that we're no longer, we'll no longer likely be confined or be able to constrain based on geography, it'll be a great in many ways. Technology will center and, 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 and expand learning. But you're going to have, I think, a generation of leaders that don't have the same, I would call it empathy, for lack of a better term. And I'm just glad I'm just glad I got to get the experience I, I received because I don't know if kids from my background are going to have access to that. And as you said, there's just going to be so many unintended consequences here. We're just, we have no idea how this might manifest itself. So a- anyways, I, interesting times. I, I agree, though. I, I don't know is almost the best answer for any question in this, but... We're just we're just speculating, yeah. and, and as you pointed out in your in your excellent post on this, it's not that things are going to change; it's that things are going to accelerate. 100%. Because what w- what was not viable was uh, tuition expanding faster than inflation every year. That that yep. in a sense yep. is the core of the income inequality gap. You can argue is that you know some students graduate with two hundred thousand dollars in debt, and and upper class students graduate with zero dollars in debt, and tuitions keep growing. So that over generations has created this enormous income inequality gap, you know, aside from how CEOs are paid and so on, it's kind of this generational thing. And I don't know, we'll see. I agree. When you and I went to college, it was a little more affordable and we were able to get that experience without worrying about, well, how am I going to pay this off afterwards, which is now kind of clouding a lot of the joyous experiences that many young people have. And, you know, you say you might not take Ellingtonia, but if if classes are much shorter to take, and I mean, I've been, I take online classes in, uh, even at this point, you know, things that interest me. So, you know, it could be that education just becomes this ongoing thing. Like I took, um, you know, a few years ago before Yuval Harari came out with the book Sapiens, I took yeah. his course on Coursera. It was a fascinating course, and so I've learned a huge amount on online courses. But it's not a it's not a social experience. It's not the experience you and I had. As kids, so I'm wondering, you know, and maybe this is jumping the gun a little on it. I'm wondering with each, and we'll talk about other categories in the new normal. But for instance, remote learning and online education, one thing you think will happen is the the combination of large tech, like you know, Google teaming up with MIT, maybe Amazon teaming up with I don't know Princeton or Carnegie Mellon. And I wonder what if there's other business models in online education. So for instance. We're used to the concept of a degree. You pick something that you're going to focus on, and then you're able to say to future employers, I have this certificate approved by this accredited Mm -hmm. institution that I'm able to speak intelligently about biology or computer science or whatever. And I wonder if there might be an opportunity for a a kind of cross-school or cross-platform accreditation. So let's say uh, you want to study something very specific, mobile computing. So programming for Android and iOS or mm-hmm. whatever. Now there might be a course at Code Academy, a course at MIT, a course at Khan Academy, a course at LinkedIn Learning, and all together that equals a de- quote unquote degree or certificate in mobile computing. Uh, I wonder if there's going to be some curation across platform or some sort of aggregation or curation that that forms as business models. 
So you, you hit on a key point in your comment, and that is the reason we get $68,000. So in my class, uh, 170 kids, we charge them $7,000 to take my class. That's about $1.2 million for me barking at them 11 to 12 nights, three hours, $100,000 a class for me and a bunch of PowerPoint. I'm good at what I do. I'm not that good. And they get about 90 to 94 points of gross margin on that. And every year they raise prices faster than inflation. So the jig is up. People realize that that's just not, that's just not worth it. But what, what we're doing is we're not educating them. People don't pay. Parents don't pay $68,000 a year for their kid to get educated at NYU. They pay for the certification. And that Correct. is the department that has probably added the most economic value or driven the most economic value at universities is the admissions department. And what they have done is they have unnaturally and artificially constrained supply such that they could put in place tests, uh, crawl background searches to make sure you don't have a felony. They interview you. They make you write long-winded applications. They get all kinds of information on you such that they have become essentially the world's best HR departments. And the majority of companies around the world don't have the time or energy or inclination to find the kid of a rich, of a rich family who would generally have better opportunities and tutors uh, that can work in teams, that is not mentally ill, that is, um, has very strong PowerPoint skills, that is socially acclimated and mature. And they're willing to say, all right, we'll pay this kid 90, we'll pay this kid $90,000 for that immense screening he or she went through in that certification called Emory or the University of Texas at Austin versus someone we could get for 55000 that may have the same skills, but doesn't have the certification. So we have been able, Stanford has tripled its applicants. Meanwhile, it hasn't grown its seats, one seat in its freshman class. So as a result, people want to recruit from Stanford because that's the ultimate certification, not because you learned anything that unique at Stanford, but because they can literally pick the most incredible people in the world at the age of 18. Right. So, so, so things like SATs and then, and then, which is a filter to schools, which then becomes a filter to jobs. They're sort of like shortcuts for evaluating to make it easy for corporations to, to, to make it actually easy for algorithms to filter prospective employees. That's a hundred percent right. At NYU, the real value add to employers who will pay one hundred and twenty, hundred thirty thousand dollars on average for a graduate of Stern? The real value add is in what they learn in my or Aswat the Motorin's class. It's the fact that we have attracted the best human capital, created the illusion of scarcity, such that we have this Hunger Games like admissions process where the kids we get are just incredible. We manicure them a little bit. We teach them how to do discounted cash flows. We teach them about brand identity. But for the most part, the key value add happens in the admissions process. Now that's bad. The admissions process, I would argue education has lost the script and we get up every year and we brag about the, turning away 90% of our applicants, which is tantamount to a homeless shelter bragging. They turned away 90% of their applicants last night. Yeah, I, that's very painful for, for kids to hear that. It's terrible. It's, it's hugely emotionally damaging during a time. And also that's not, that's not our role in society as academics. We've lost the script. We're public servants. We're not luxury brands. And the fact that we have constrained admission, you know, the head of admissions at Harvard said we could have doubled our freshman class and not sacrificed any quality. And so the question then is, well, with a $38 billion endowment, why aren't you doing that, boss? Uh, we need to yeah. dramatically expand the certification, the experience, the number of people who can attend college. And to your point, technology will probably enable a lot of that. But it's going to be a different type of experience. It's going to reformat the entire category. We have asked for it. I mean, we have stuck out our chin, and the mother of all fists is coming for us. Big tech partnering with these world-class universities. People underestimate the certification and the brand power. The strongest brand in the world is not Apple. The strongest brands in the world are Harvard, MIT, Carnegie Mellon, Essex. That's such a great point. These brands have been built over centuries and they have tremendous affection and goodwill. Nobody decides to donate $200 million to Samsung. They will give 200, you know, John Paulson gives $300 million to have his name on the engineering building at Harvard. The amount of goodwill, the, the power of these brands is just staggering. And when Google shows up or Microsoft shows up to Berkeley and says, we can create a two year program to give people not only not only programming skills, but data mining, analytics, and you, Berkeley, on the front end will do a lot of the screening and the official certification to break the cartel 
and we'll take the engineering department at Berkeley from 4,100 students to 41,000, it's going to be, it's going to have a lot of upsides and a lot of downsides as, as we know it. But big tech, big tech and some of these iconic brands is going to be this monster cocktail that is going to sweep out just a ton of like mediocre to even good brands in academia. And it's just going to further consolidate power and uh, kind of what I'll call shareholder value amongst a smaller group of players. If you think about education, the cartel is held and it's mostly helped the, you know, the university of the university of uh, central Wisconsin. And I don't even know if that's a university charges approximately awesome school, by the way, is it? No, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it, it, but it, generally speaking, it would charge the same tuition as the University of Wisconsin, the Badgers, which is a great university because it's a cartel. That cartel is about to be broken apart. And, you, and without that pricing power and that scarcity, you're just going to see a ton of universities go away. So MIT is going to expand their enrollment from 20,000 to 200,000. And who wouldn't want to go to MIT if they can? They'll charge lower rates. It'll be a two or three year program instead of four year. You'll lose a lot of that magic. And like everything else in software, a disproportionate amount of the, the, the fruit will go to a small players. But people thinking these new online, there'll be a ton of shareholder value on online tools to help people teach, SaaS-based programs that make MIT, Google better. But the notion we're going to have a bunch of standalone organic universities making a ton of money, I just don't buy it. I think the brands are just too powerful. That's interesting. So you think still, uh, if you're an employer... You're not gonna. You're, if you take, if you get two resumes and one says, "Oh, he's taken, you know, Java, C plus plus, object oriented programming," you know, at all these online schools, versus this guy got a, a had a B average at MIT slash Google. Uh, you think still they'll go towards the the MIT slash Google employee and pay more? Double E woman who rode crew at Dartmouth. Oh, mm -hmm. she kicks the shit out of anyone. I don't care how many classes you've taken a general assembly or uh, until there's some sort of some sort of incredible and, and there'll be a lot of money here uh, business able to create this ultimate certification whether it's testing or that says this person is outstanding there's just a certain maturity there's a certain grit there's a certain empathy there's a certain ability to 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 work with others that these unit that corporations will pay uh, a lot pay up for across w across those universities or their ability to identify those people and, and 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 matriculate them. There'll be a lot of opportunity, but the real big money will be partnering with universities. Apple partners with Bacconi to create this incredible program around design or UX. Uh, you know, it, it, there's just going to be these 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 cocktails of of uh, this chocolate and peanut butter of Google and Georgia Tech. I mean, my gosh, who wouldn't want that certification? Well, well, and by the way, it's not like Google has to only partner with one college. That's you know, right. it could be that Google blesses its brand on 50 colleges and maybe that that's where the cross platform learning happens. So, oh, I could take this class at Georgia Tech online because I like this professor and I could take this class at NYU because I want to learn from Scott Galloway and it's all blessed by Google. Well, that's the key is that these guys could slip in. And that's actually an interesting insight, James, is that going back to the notion, the key attribute here that results in all the margin is certification. The new certifiers could become big tech where they figure out all sorts of tools and tests to certify you. And uh, uh, because that is the, at the end of the day, I could take every course. I almost didn't graduate from UCLA. I was an academic creation eight times, subject to dismissal three times. If I had taken every course, and just failed calculus for the third time, which I almost did in my last semester of my fifth year, and not got a degree. I would have, I would have been, I couldn't have job, gotten a job at Morgan Stanley. I wouldn't have gotten into business school. I wouldn't have gotten the, had the credibility to start a business. I wouldn't be where I am now. Yeah, I wouldn't have been. It wouldn't have been. I wouldn't have had ninety eight percent because I'd gotten ninety eight percent as far. I would have been th two thirds. So it wasn't that five years at UCLA that got me the opportunities. It was getting that certification that said, you have made it through that changed my life. So there's no calibration here. As soon as a company steps in and says, all right, if you took the basics and you're pretty good and you're 80 or 90 percent as good as someone who went all four years such that you should have 80 or 90 percent of the spoils in the marketplace. Right now, it's very binary. You either get certified by one, you get in and then two, you graduate or you don't. 
So there's probably all sorts of spaces or white spaces to be filled here. I, I don't know how it's right. going to play out. I do know one right. thing. A lot of a lot, a lot of faculty are going to make a lot less money moving forward. Yeah, and I think you're right. We don't really know the final business model. So for instance, uh, this binary uh, conclusion that happens at your education, I had a similar thing where I had a, my senior year, I had a D minus in Fortran and I needed a D to graduate yeah. to, for my overall GPA. And so I literally went to the professor. I did and the I same thing. And, and they, they say yes. Did, they say yes, yeah. right? They say yes, because what are they going to do? Uh, not let me graduate because yeah. of this. But, uh, uh, you know, I think, though, it's going to be interesting. Maybe it could be that people are going to just be have a subscription model to university where they're permanently enrolled in Google education somehow or Apple education or Amazon education. And that is the enough certification. That's enough of a filter. Because you think about it, jobs only use college as a filter, probably mostly for that first job. After that, like if you worked at Morgan Stanley, if you then wanted to work at a, let's hypothetically say a hedge fund, no one, people will care where you went to college, but they'll really care more about that you were at Morgan Stanley. Or it used to be the case that, you know, for your second job, people looked at, you know, it was a, a big benefit if you worked at Procter & Gamble or General Electric. So, so then you learn marketing and management skills in the real world. Now it's better, instead of working at Procter & Gamble, it's better if you work at Google Oh, he's coming from Google. He must know something. Oh, he's coming from Amazon. He must know something. So the, the brands have changed in terms of the second job, but there's still that. I, I never really thought of the effect of brand on getting, you know, the the second or third job, but it exists as well. And uh, you know, I, I wonder that, that whole that whole environment's going to change, and and I think there's going to be business models around it that we don't really know yet. Well, it's a ten trillion dollar industry. It's it's the most other than healthcare. It's the industry most ripe for for disruption. The general trend will be what I refer to as dispersion, and that is we have leveraged geography and duopoly status in every city to constrain supply and maintain ridiculous margins. And we're naked when people start over people when people start eavesdropping on their kids fall classes for cost accounting or whatever it is and they see what's going on in the zoom class and the majority of professors brighten up a room by leaving it and are even least co less compelling on zoom you're just going to have a ton of people who've been writing the checks blindly say you know what we need to rethink this because it's happening i don't know there's almost a mini revolution right now among parents when they're seeing what's ha actually happening in their kids classes at these tony private schools when they try and take them on zoom it, there's there's a near riot across some of these private schools when parents see what is how these how these schools have not adapted to online learning. Like, let me get this. You want me to continue to send in the same tu tuition payment for this? So it's going to be it's going to be fascinating. It, it's it's about time. Um, and yeah, you know, like I, I'm 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 excited and both scared to see. Uh, what happens here. And I worry that it just, as you said, it doesn't change trends as much as it accelerates them. The biggest and best brands get more powerful and stronger and the certifications only become more and more important and it, it results in even greater income inequality and even more spoils aggregating. If Google MIT partner and offer 500,000 slots, they'll get them and they can charge yeah. half the price and deliver the same margins to both universities. And then who's going to go, for God's sakes, who's going to go to Fordham? You know, it's just, you, and you'll see one, you'll see a small group of brands just aggregate the vast majority of the spoils. And the, and the profs and the administrators who, get a tr who, who have an opportunity to get into that information economy will do incredibly well. But the other 700 business schools, you know, we're, I could describe NYU Stern as one of the 15 top 10 schools. We'll be fine because we'll be one of the aggregators. But what about number 45? What's, what happens to them? So look, a, a, a tremendous destruction in jobs, ton of spoils to a few players, a deflation and egalitarian spread of information across a lot of consumers, which is great. But what we saw play out across media because of Facebook and Google, what we're seeing play out across retail with Amazon is about to happen in education. Let's stop to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Yeah, and I and again, we might slightly disagree on this. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Yep. I I wrote about this first in in 
2005 and uh, in a column in the Financial Times, and I got a lot of heat for it. And I think now at least it's a discussion. And now because of this virus, uh, you know, there's there's it, it looks like it's going to happen sooner rather than later, where there's going to be some disruption in education. And and that could be very fortunate to the next generation of kids because they won't spend as much, hopefully, and and we'll have to see what happens. But I think I think one theme of what we're talking about, though, and you mentioned the word geography, essentially the new normal is going to be, my guess is, and I'm curious what you think, the new normal is going to be defined by the word remote. Like everything that is related to the word remote is going to flourish and, and new business models for things that aren't related to the word remote are going to have to happen. Like in education, there's going to be have to... The word remote is going to have to go in there somehow. Yeah, you're, so you're right. So if you think about retail, what Amazon sort of did was it took distribution centers out of Memphis or for FedEx from catalogs, and it made a bunch of dist- it dis- it dispersed distribution such that in New York, if you order from Amazon now, you can get something in forty seven minutes for free, as opposed to William Sonoma, who used to charge you thirty nine ninety five to ship you Calphalon in seven to nine days. So. Amazon sort of created a dispersion or distribution of geography around retail. And that's probably going to happen in education where the university, the actual campus is going to be less of a constraining factor. And we're going to be able to disperse or distribute Carnegie Mellon's brand certification and learning to a much greater geography because the constraining factor here has mostly been geography. And it's been our, our strategy at NYU has been simple. We buy everything in Soho. And it's worked really well because people want to live there. They want to experience that college experience there. When you're no longer have, you're no longer bound by geography, but you also don't have that as a choke point or kind of your scarcity to create a luxury brand, what happens to your pricing power? And what it means is if, is if, it, if Wharton can be everywhere around the world, they'll garner more and more spoils. But that also means the University of Philadelphia, I don't even know if that is a university, gets hurt really badly. Uh, because there's just going to be a flight to quality. There's going to be more access and you're going to see, you're just going to, I mean, just as right now in retail, nothing's changing. It's just accelerating department store, especially retail apparel, shadow themselves, 70 or 80% are going away. They're the walking dead right now. Grocery delivery is picking up. It should have, it's been two or 3% of grocery in the last a few years, it's going to accelerate to ten or fifteen percent as people realize they don't need to go and squeeze lemons. They can, they can, you know, they want it to be. They can have it delivered. There's going to be remote work. I'd hate to be in the business of office space right now. I do think people are going to want to get back to it, but not to the same extent ever. I'm, I'm rethinking work. I've just always thought, oh, you have to have people in the same room, and I'm wondering. Well, I still believe that, but is it once or twice a week instead of five times a week? Yeah, we're going to, you're right, remote distance, the death of distance, geography, this pandemic has taught us that, you know, viruses could give a good goddamn about borders. It's just so ridiculous. We haven't had a more unified global response here that we, you know, we have the World Health Organization, which quite frankly, probably really hasn't stepped up to the plate here as a great brand. But just as we had NATO, we're going to have some sort of global CDC, I think, form. But you're right, the geography is is going to be we're going to have this, what I'll call the great dispersion. And the other place we're going to disperse from the kind of physical um, physical density, if you will, is healthcare. Healthcare was largely delivered through hospitals and a doctor's office. And that was their core advantage to create all sorts of HIPAA compliance and pricing power. And when I just want a, ref- a refill on my a refill on my Lunesta for when I travel because I have trouble sleeping. I used to, I couldn't even text my doctor. I had to make an appointment. I had to go to this unfriendly place where they sat behind screens where they would open them, tell me to fill out the same fucking paperwork I filled out nine times before, wait there. I mean, it's just ridiculous. That is about to be distributed. Unfortunately, the distribution is probably going to take place through the existing players. It's probably going to happen through Amazon where you're going to say, Alexa, my kid has a rash. And then I'll say, okay, in 10 minutes, meet back at your Amazon show. You go on, there's a high def, you know, intelligent camera. You show a, 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 a dermatologist, a pediatric dermatologist, your kid's arm and says, okay, I have sent a prescription for whatever it is, some eczema treatment to CVS who can either deliver it or you can go pick it up. And you have distribution of retail, distribution of healthcare, uh, but what you'll also have is because the space constraint is no longer there, the doctor doesn't have as much pricing power. Um, and you're going to have the same traditional players probably soak up a lot of the a lot of the economic benefit in terms of that innovation. So 
it's going to be a great new age for consumers. It's going to be a great new age for information workers. It's going to be a great time to own Amazon and Google stock. But we're going to see the same trends around income inequality, second and third tier players go away, the same density of monopolies. I just see it accelerating. That was a lot. Right. No, but it, it, it's it's very valuable to, to hear that point of view. So you, telemedicine is obviously going to get bigger and there's going to be either AI or big data or robotics all kind of around that sort of helping helping facilitate telemedicine, teletherapy, all sorts of things. On the delivery side, the, again, anything with the remote in it is going to sort of boom. So drones for delivery, robot, robotics for packing boxes, and, and, and so on is going to probably be huge. And there's probably going to be business models we can't even imagine that's going to develop around that. What about um, content? So right now, uh, you know, content and recreation. So right now we go to movie theaters, we go on cruises, we travel to business meetings or we travel for, for vacations, but we also watch content online. And that's, you can't even imagine that being larger, except it's going to get larger at, at this point. Yeah, we, we have an explosion. And I, you know, I love television. I think this is, if we look back, I believe in a hundred years, 200 years, we look back on the defining art form of our age, I think it'll be television. Scripted television, we'll spend more on scripted television this year than we spent in the entire decade of the 80s or 90s. And it's just it's just striking how much good TV there is out there and how much content there is out there. I do think one thing about this remote um, aspect or trend that you brought up and what's happening across media right now is I'm in the midst of uh, so I'm, my podcast Prop G launch did really well, and I started getting approached by uh, networks about doing a TV show, like a business review show. And what's interesting is since we started the conversations and now, the budgets have been cut remotely or cut drastically. They're saying, all right, instead of ordering six episodes at half a million bucks, we want to order 10 at 100 or 150 grand because we're going to shoot it from your home. And what we're finding, we mean the media network, is uh, media industry is that, yeah, you know, Anderson Cooper from his basement isn't as compelling, but it's compelling enough. And that all the money we were spending on production values. So, so back up, fastest growing analog brands in history, fastest zero to billion dollars were Old Navy and Southwest Airlines. What was their algorithm? 80% of the gap, 80% of Delta Airlines for 50% of the price of the gap or Delta Airlines. 80% of X, for 50% of X is the gangster cocktail to accelerate. I think what we're going to find in media is that across a lot of categories, whether it's news, that 80% of the quality of, call it NBC News Tonight, for dramatically less money is going to find a big, big market. And this, as you said, I'm being set up at home for all kinds of stuff. Podcasting is booming. And uh, I think we're, you know, we have a huge acceleration and both you and I are doing this from home. We don't need to be at a studio. The sound quality probably isn't as good as it was a few weeks ago. I was posting on YouTube. I'm no longer doing that. But we're going to see an explosion in the amount of content because we're going to find that 80% of the production quality for a fraction of the price is a pretty good cocktail and it's going to create even more and more content. And again, it all goes back, everything for me goes back to big tech you develop tremendous emotional connection with content. Your NPS score on your cable provider is is you know four. Your NPS on Netflix is sixty because you think of you think of um, uh, House of Cards or or whatever another great Netflix um, series might be. So the big tech guys have said, let's create that emotional connection and cement it with content. And even if it costs us five billion dollars, we're Apple, and if we get another 2% upgrades for on our you know, iPhone 11 or whatever it is because of content, because we can give away you know, the morning show, it's worth it. So even that industry, you want to talk about an industry that's about to get the shit kicked out of it or be reformatted. In LA, the, pan, the panzer tanks of Amazon, Apple, and not yet Google, but uh, have shown up. And there'll be some big winners. If you're in the business of content creation and you're the best, you're going to get an enormous contract. But all the other traditional networks, how does how does Viacom compete in a world where they have to make money on their content within that within that universe of content? Whereas Apple just needs to show they're selling a few more smartphones and they can spend 
spend a Game of Thrones budget on what is effectively a Murphy Brown product called The Morning Show. But you just can't compete with that if you're in traditional media. You can't spend you can't spend $120 million an episode on what is a fairly mediocre like drama about daytime TV. I mean, that's well, just, I think, I think, you can't do it. I mean, well, I think what will happen, though, is people will be talking, you know, c- content companies will be talking to people like you and say, and, and apply this 80-20 rule that you were just, ta- you basically apply the 80-20 rule to content generation and enjoyment. So like you said, Anderson Cooper at home is maybe, 20% of the work and infrastructure and facility as when Anderson Cooper is in the studio. And yet Anderson Cooper at home is going to still provide 80% That's of right. the value. That's so right. there's this 80, 20 rule of content where people are going to be willing to, it's going to be kind of this merger of t- uh, traditional television and, and the quality of that with YouTube, where you're seeing there's an insanely entertaining things on YouTube that don't have the brand power of an Anderson Cooper. It doesn't have the, the kind of brand strength of a CNN behind it, but it's just as entertaining, even though it's, it's rough around the edges. It might be, it might be 80, 20 squared to so the, the 64, four rule, where just 4% of the, of the input creates 64% of the output. And I don't know. I think that's going to be interesting because you're right. They're, they're not going to spend half a million a show. They're going to spend a hundred thousand a show and tell you to figure it out from there. Yeah, and they'll and they'll sponsor. What they'll do is they'll get to pilot five shows, and because there's a certain there's a certain X factor in all of this, and they'll get to pilot five shows and say, "All right, we'll pick the winner," and then the winner gets to increase their budget, as opposed to taking these huge risks up front. It'll be a way of of, of being more thoughtful around capital allocation in terms of um, investing across risk adjusted budgets. But content, you know, content is now. Hollywood's been featureized, and that is content is now a feature of a smartphone company. It's a feature of an e-commerce company. Whereas uh, HBO was getting spending seventy five million dollars for every Emmy, and Amazon has to spend three hundred and fifty million. So you think, well, Amazon's media group must be unsustainable? No, it's not. It's the other way around. HBO is unsustainable because Amazon can afford to spend three hundred fifty million dollars to get an Emmy. And slowly but surely, they'll start taking people from HBO and the traditional players. They'll bring their cost per Emmy down. And before you know it, they'll have quality content at twice the investment. But they can afford it because if if retention around Amazon Prime goes from 88% to 92%, that results in an incremental $2.4 billion in annual recurring revenue valued at 10 to 15 times because it's recurring revenue. So it's accretive to them, whereas the traditional players just can't make those types of investments. Uh, you know, I right. see... I see just as that kid saw dead people everywhere, I see the monopolies getting stronger everywhere. I just see how this all benefits a small number of players. Yeah, I, I think I agree. I mean, you know, part of what makes made HBO such a strong brand though, and and but but this is to your point, this is the fragility of the system, is that they had very good, talented executives picking picking the shows because their budget was limited versus an Amazon or a Google or an Apple because their budget was limited. They had the winner, whether it was by luck or because they had skills at picking executives, the winner were the ones who who had the best executives picking content. So HBO was, was probably the best. And as you pointed out, other people started hiring executives from HBO. So Showtime, HBO's biggest competitor, their CEO for many years was the former head of marketing at HBO. Viacom, their former CEO was used to be the CEO of HBO. Uh, people at Universal, people at Netflix, HBO kind of spread their executives around the industry to create original programming everywhere. Even the CEO of uh, Stars was a former CEO of HBO. So I think that's what will happen: is that uh, you know the talent gets dispersed, but then these places that have infinite money to spend, combined with slightly better talent among their executives is able to produce some things that are just as good quality and nobody remembers anyway, the bad shows, they only remember the good shows. So it doesn't really affect the brand of Amazon to put out 50 bad shows in one good show because everyone will just watch the good show and they won't even remember the bad shows. And you're right. I think, but I think that's like you said, I think that's a trend that's already started and it's going to just accelerate now. Yeah. It's so in 10 or 20 years or sooner than that, when they write cases around culture HBO will be ground zero because HBO was able to create a culture of creativity that created breakthrough world-class content 
on a fraction of the budget that these other guys are having to spend to get half the quality. I mean, if you look at HBO spent seven or $8 billion a couple of years ago. No, I'm sorry. They spent, I think, three to $5 billion. Apple is already spending more on content than HBO. And look at the content that HBO puts out and look at the content that Apple has been putting out. So there's something in that culture now. I think one of the greatest uh, brand blunders in history, looking back, will be when uh, AT&T purchased Time Warner and put the former CTO of DirecTV in charge of the Warner TV group, including HBO, and came in and said, I agree. let's scale this. HBO is a luxury brand. That's like walking into the Louvre and saying, let's scale this. And the the fact that they're turning a Birkin bag into a coach bag by chunking up with a big bang theory and all the other shit that, that Turner and all those guys have, that's a positioning that Amazon has is bulk. And Apple is about to steal HBO's positioning, go all vertical, hire the best talent, be known as having the best place to work for key talent. And before you know it, Al Pacino and Reese Witherspoon and all the best directors and showrunners are going to be at Apple because they'll get to be where there's kind of what I'll call a more precious reverence for kind of original content that HBO used to own. And now, I mean, it's just, it's just, it's like they're taking Hermes and distributing it through Walmart and putting on messenger bags. I think it's a huge brand blunder, but you're going to see how does Disney not win? How does Apple not win over time? How does Amazon not win over time? And the traditional players I think are just going to get the shit kicked out of them. They're just not going to be able to afford because they can't monetize great content by selling more paper towels or smartphones. They can't justify the investment. And at the end of the day, if you, if you want to watch, you know, you want to watch shows, you don't want to watch networks. So you watch Fleabag, which is amazing. You'll watch the outsider, which is actually an HBO program, but eventually money wins, capital wins. Eventually the best, pe- most talented people will go with a capital. It's an Amazon will figure it out. And we're going to see Jeff Bezos and his, his girlfriend at the Academy Awards more and more, which makes me want to fucking throw up, James. Just fucking <laughs> throw up. Well, maybe there won't be an Academy Awards because the other thing is <laughs> right, content, on, content on YouTube and podcasts are getting a- as many views or more as traditional tv i mean there's youtube channels they get hundreds of millions of views a, 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 a week and i know that's not the same type of view is counted differently but you know you look at joe rogan with over 100 million downloads a month on his podcast certainly there's a lot more there's a lot more opportunities to shine even outside the big brands and and i, and I think a challenge for a consumer listening to this is that if you're a content creator everything's going to be about how you build your own audience, whether it's on, on a single platform or across many platforms, uh, that's going to create value for that. The new, the next Al Pacino's will not come out of a uh, great box office numbers initially, but will come out of who's got the most followers, which is why, you know, TikTok's such a weird phenomenon with all these teenage girls getting 30 million followers. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting, so there'll always be a space for truly genius content, right? If you, uh, I mean, I've been watching this program on Netflix called Unorthodox about this. Oh, I've heard that's very good. Oh, it's just so moving. I mean, magic! It's magic. This this young woman is such a talent. The, the, it's the writing is and the directing are just so clean and so on, and it's such a compelling story. That genius will still break through. For the rest of us, the reason why I was approached about doing a TV show is because I have a decent following across my social platforms. And what they've come to realize, and my publisher realized this with my book, is they're not paying me to write the book. They're paying me to market it. And the reason why I got a podcast deal with Westwood One, and I'm boasting now, and, it, and the, the launch is going pretty well, is because I have platforms to market it on. So you're right that that if you're if you're counseling young people, you know, in my brand strategy class, it's like get good at LinkedIn, Instagram, TikTok, because your ability, if you want to be in the business of content creation, you want to have a comedy club, you want to you want to have a podcast. So much about that initial velocity, which indicates, you know, that the trajectory you get off the aircraft carrier largely indicates the trajectory of whether or not this thing gets to the speed of sound or crashes in the ocean is going to be a function of your 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 brand across these different platforms. And everybody thinks, well, I'll just start posting shit on Instagram and it'll work. I know you've done this. I have made a massive investment the last decade in Twitter and LinkedIn and YouTube. And it is a pain in the ass. And it has been every day 
every day I'm trying to find interesting shit to put out on my networks and invest, and I don't see an immediate payoff. It's a definition of brand building. You don't see any payoff the next day. But over time, if you're disciplined about it, your brand just gets stronger and stronger and stronger. And you can use that brand as a halo to launch different products. But absolutely, these kids who are getting good at these platforms are going to have such an advantage because pretty soon in, in any type of content creation, publishers basically are going to, I'm looking for professors to teach sprints. I'm doing an online startup called Prop G. And the professors I'm looking to do these next online sprints, we look at their social following. And it is really difficult to find academics who have any sort of academic credibility, but have over 10,000 followers on Twitter. It's just weird that they just haven't embraced these mediums. But yeah, these are the or, new, or, these or are the new not, bands. Or they're not creating good, unique content. It, it's a skill to create. It's a skill to figure out a platform. And then it's a skill to figure out what content, what's your voice on that platform. So it's the same difficult skill as learning how to be a good writer. You, most people just can't sit down and write a novel for the first time and say, oh, I'll use this. I'll be great at this platform, the writing platform. It doesn't work like that. There's there's a skill involved. A great TikToker is different from a great YouTuber, is different from a great uh, writer, and they're not they're not easy. And I think, I, and, and, and uh, in these past 10 years, along with building your brand, I'm sure you realize that your your voice on these brands, uh, on these platforms has, has changed, and, and you had to learn how to have a voice that fit the platform. And, and that was uniquely yours, which which you did, which you succeeded in doing. It's really it's it is really interesting. The the platforms, and it's taken me a while to figure this out. I can tell what platform someone has discovered my content based on the way they greet me. If it's somebody a little bit older who is also an academic, also an author, they come up and they want to have a longer conversation. They want to set up coffee and really talk about a concept. That means they've read one of my books. If I get a high five from a guy on a bike running by me and say, Prof G, you're the man, I'm like, oh, he's seen one of my videos. It's the 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 recognition off of videos is bro, bro culture. If I get a really thoughtful email from a mom or someone who wants to have a more, you know, what I'll call you move them emotionally. Anyone you move emotionally, it's through the written word. It's through yeah. a blog post. There's something about the written word that goes straight to someone's to someone's heart. And then the podcast. Or they come up to you and they talk to you as if they know you. Because when you're in their ears and you're speaking, they're the, under the impression you have a relationship with them. So you have, if somebody comes up to you and talks to you as if, and you're sitting there and you're going, wait, do I know this person? If, am I forgetting who they are? No, they've listened to your podcast. So different right. mediums have different sort of emotional resonance with people. And I can be really irreverent on my YouTube videos. I try not to be as irreverent in my blog posts because it's just not, it's just a different, it's a different, um, a different medium, but I'm fascinated by it, and I get it wrong all the time. I can't figure out TikTok. I'm not very good. Um, I, I've never been able to figure out Instagram. I just don't. I just don't get it. Uh, but yeah, your it, ability it, to surf mediums is hugely important. It, it's interesting because, like what you said, by by the way someone greets me on the street, I could tell. Like it used to be, everyone who greeted me, nine out of ten people who greeted me, has had read my writing, and I've been writing professionally for. 20 years. I have over 20 books out there, some bestsellers. But now when someone sees me on the street, it's usually nine out of 10 times, it's usually my podcast. And sometimes depending on their age and how they greet me, I could actually tell which other person's podcast they've seen me on, whether it's a comedy podcast right. or a tech podcast or an entrepreneurship podcast or a more you know philosophical podcast. I could usually tell where they first encountered me and and then they, and then usually they found their way to to my podcast or Twitter or whatever. But it, it's going to be interesting because then there's going to be uh, how you transfer audience from one platform to the other because you're not kids already know you don't want to be dependent on any one platform. If you're big on Vine and then Vine disappears, you need to have a, an established base somewhere else. And so I think I think email list management and and SMS text management is going to be kind of uh, even more important in the future. To, to, so you like Al Pacino never had to control the 20 million people, not control, but he never had to communicate to the 20 million people who followed him from movie to movie. Now people like you are going to have to be able to communicate one on one with an audience that you bring into your book or in, you bring into your podcast audience, or you bring into your YouTube audience. So I think that's going to be important in the new normal. A, a, again, and this is underlining more the, the remote feature and the disconnected feature of of all these brands, the disconnection from brand and quality. 
What's been your most successful medium? You've done books, you've done videos, you do your podcast, you write a lot. What what would you define as your most successful medium? Again, I, I grew up on writing books and and you know, one of my books has has done extremely well, or two of my books have done extremely well and and kind of catapulted me to an audience. But it's really a combination of blog, Twitter, books on the sort of tech side and building an email list. But again, nine out of ten people who who stop me on the street or who write me, it's because of podcasts. And so that actually lends myself to, you know, it leads me to believe I'm changing the format of my podcast a little bit. So it's more me telling stories or having normal conversations with people like this, as opposed to me uh, interviewing as if I was a journalist, which I've, which I'm not. And, and so I think podcasting has been huge and, and, and we'll see, I'm trying to make the leap into uh, a little bit more video style. Yeah, it's it's um, it's going to be. I mean, how long have you been your, doing this your podcast? podcast your, right. your, six years. Your podcast is going to be for you. I know you just started the Prof G podcast. I meant to mention that in the in the intro, but my guess is ultimately your podcast is going to be your biggest win for you. And and, and also you you've done work with Kara Swisher in in the podcast world. Your your podcast with Recode and has been have been very successful and. Uh, uh, I think that's going to, oh, your, your, your books are like your degree that kind of establishes you as a legit thinker and someone to be listened to, but it's the podcast, how people are going to be exposed to you ultimately is, is what I believe. And I'm, when I say you, I mean you specifically. Uh, that, that's a generous comment The the, you know, you've done books, you've done 20 books, which to me is just incredible because for me, writing a book or I've written two now is like having served in the Marines and that is you're glad you did it. I just found writing, I found writing those books probably the hardest things I've ever done. Yeah. Writing is writing is like, I always say to myself in the middle of a book, I am never, ever going to do this yeah. again. It's yeah. awful. And of course, then as soon as I'm done, I do another one, but, but I, I like writing articles, but the, the biggest bang for the buck right now for me is podcasts. And I'm, working it on, I mean, I have over a million followers on LinkedIn, but, but those are just distribution platforms. Right. They don't find my, my voice. Whereas writing and, uh, that, that's why it's good to be platform independent and just figure out what kind of content belongs on which platform, you know? And so, so then I guess, continuing the theme of remote, we've talked about remote commerce. So, so every, every business model related to that is going to succeed. We've talked about remote medicine, remote learning, how content's going to get disperse your your view is the big tech players will have the brands to come in but i think that's going to combine with individuals uh, uh sort of making a name for themselves in different ways like i might not have to work at goldman sachs to be considered an expert on money it might be that my podcast on money creates a brand for myself enough to go on to another business model or whatever but uh I, along with this though there's a lot of destruction as well as disruption you know, commercial real estate, if everything goes remote, is probably going to have problems. As you mentioned, hundreds of universities are going to have problems, maybe hundreds of online brands because if everyone uh, converges around Amazon. You know, hundreds of online brands might have problems. There's going to be remote work. So anything relating to, you know, virtual meetings and conferences and so on is, is probably going to be big, but that's going to end the need for uh, event spaces, really. So what are going to be the consequences? as you know hundreds of billion do billions of dollars worth of businesses like commercial real estate could falter i think i think it's again it's it's this is the great accelerant that i see covid-19 not as typically after a lot of crises whether it's world war 2 they created a greater i call it comity of man between europe and us i mean germany and japan became our allies that's just remarkable we changed the world to a certain degree. NATO was this incredible, you know, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization has largely kept the peace globally, not just in Europe, but largely kept the peace globally. So there's enormous changes typically coming out of wars. I would argue that this doesn't change any trends. It just accelerates them. And the, 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 the trend I see accelerating across all these categories, look at, look at healthcare. I think the biggest winner in healthcare is going to be Amazon. And it's not, it's not that consumers won't benefit. Consumers benefit from Amazon now. Uh, healthcare costs will come down. More people will have access to good healthcare because of Amazon. But you're going to see a tremendous destruction in jobs. 
you're going to see a consolidation of media of, of healthcare providers and players. A lot of people think it's going to be Apple. I think it's going to be Amazon. It's going to be great to be someone who uh, needs healthcare, which is great. The consumer will win here. It's going to be great to work at Amazon. It's going to be great to be an Amazon shareholder. For everyone else, it's going to be a kick in the nuts. And healthcare is one of the largest employers of, of really strong paying jobs in the world. You know, everyone from healthcare providers, uh, the people in the supply chain, who you would argue couldn't happen to a nicer people, whether it's insurance companies or administrators, a lot of those jobs and salaries, the oxygen is just going to start to leave the room. And people say, well, as long as it's good for the consumer, that's fine. That's a decent argument. That's kind of the American well, but, way. But the jobs create the consumer, though, is the problem. Well, that that's a thing. We're just headed towards this economy where we have three, we're going to have 350 million serfs serving 3 million lords. I mean, it's awesome it, to come out to have, if you can slipstream into that, Amazon's my largest recruiter. The kids who get jobs at Amazon, they're going to do really well. There's never going to be a better time to have money. There's never going to be a worse time, you know, to, to be everybody else. You're going to, it's, it's, it's a great time to be wealthy right now. We're going to see deflation. If you can survive this economically, you, every, the price of everything is about to go down. The problem is fewer and fewer people are going to have money, right? They're going to be more people on, you know, it's, you'll never have a bigger TV you never have a more powerful phone, but you'll probably be on your couch and just won't have the enough disposable income to afford education or healthcare. But I just see the trends, income inequality, although a lot of people would argue a pandemic redistributes income. I don't see it. I think the biggest and best companies are only going to consolidate their power. I, I run a startup right now. In the last two weeks, we've had two people uh, go to Nike and one to Google. And mm -hmm. during a, those companies clean up in a time like this because they're great companies. They're more secure. In frothy economies, people go to startups like yours and mine. In economies like this, they they retreat to the, you know, to the General Motors and IBMs of the world. So it's, you know, it's going to be fascinating to see across media, across education, across culturally, you know, the, the, the one piece I hope of optimism here, the platinum lining, is that to date, a lot of people would argue that millennials have uh, suffered from kind of this screen time and concierge parenting that has turned them into sort of a fragile generation. Jonathan Hyde, one of my mm -hmm. colleagues, says that might this be an event that creates more resilience, more a more global perspective, a more of a recognition that we need to hold, join hands with our brothers and sisters in Europe, learn from how thoughtful and competent, um, and to a certain extent, corrupt some of the uh, some of the approach to handling this virus in Asia was. And might we develop a global CDC? Might we recognize that borders are less important than we thought? Might we, you know, might we come out of this with a generation of leadership across millennials and Gen Z? that are a little bit more global, a little bit more empathetic, a little bit more proactive, that realize defunding governments, that government is important, government matters, and that this delegitimization of federal workers is just inappropriate. And then our frontline warriors right now are generally people that are working for the federal government and healthcare. So I'd like to think that we come out of this, I'm hopeful we come out of this with a generation of leadership that is more empathetic, thinks more long-term, thinks more about the comedy of man and realizes that the key isn't to create more billionaires, but to create more, you know, more jobs and greater empathy across border. Anyways, that's my speech, James. That's my speech. No, that that's a great speech. And and my my well, one question is in that is that uh, what you keep saying when we come out of this, there's also a chance we don't come out of this. And I'm not saying from a healthcare point of view, like the pandemic will eventually, you know, sooner probably rather than later. At this point, we'll we'll rise and fall and we'll start thinking about the next wave and the next year and cures and vaccines and do we have enough ventilators and so on but that will kind of take its course but coming out of it we just dis discussed possibly the destruction of 80 percent of the capital in the u.s like if commercial real estate busts that that has a ripple effect across many industries if um if hundreds of schools go out of business that creates a, a, a ripple effect if uh hundreds of other types of industries go out of business. Could it be the case that there's so much quick destruction that we're left with people just on the street ex expecting the next UBI bill, the next stimulus bill to get passed, and we don't know what to do with these 40 million workers? Like, is there a point of no return if we keep this economy shut down long enough? I don't think so. I, I, you know, I might be naive, but my sense is the terrible thing about crises is they always happen, but the wonderful thing is they always end. And I think we've faced much bigger tests. I think a lot. Like what? 
Well, I don't think about I don't think about us personally because the reality is we have lived a charmed life. Uh, at least I have in terms of access to a world class education in the form of the University of California, coming of economic age in the era of the internet and processing power, globalization, which benefited economically people with an education. But I think you know I'm an atheist, but I, I say I have gods, and that is when I'm ever feeling sorry for myself, which is one of the things I hate about myself. Um, uh, my God is my, my, uh, maternal grandfather who I never met, Norman Levine, who used to escort his four daughters and son to a makeshift bomb shelter in the London tube in 1943, uh, London, because their house had been destroyed during the Blitzkrieg. And on the way during a, during a bomb raid on the, uh, during the panic, his oldest daughter at 11 was run over by a truck. So I'm sitting mm-hmm. here. I'm sitting here and then after the war, survived the war, and then three years later died at home alone after seeing a doctor once of bowel cancer. And I'm sitting here pissed off and upset and feeling sorry for myself because I'm, you know, because I'm less wealthy than I was next week. And the reality is the if we just demonstrate a fraction of the metal, if we demonstrate a fraction of the resilience and the leadership that our grandparents demonstrated, we're going to be just fine. So I just feel like this is our generation's test. Right. This is our generation's test, and I think we're up to it. Um, and I think uh, we're going to absolutely come out of this. There's no doubt about it. It's going to be a rough couple of years. But, you know, our species is the most adaptable. I do think Americans are a generous, innovative people. And I just hope this brings us back together, if you will, again. And unfortunately, there's a lot of evidence that pandemics don't do that. But, oh, yeah, we'll definitely be back. Uh, we'll, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with America that can't be fixed with what's right with America. I always get worried, though, that I don't know. I get worried that you look at the last time there's been, you know, look at after the black or the the, the Spanish flu, uh, there was issues with, you know, that's when we, you know, the Soviet Union was created. That's when all these, you know, Marxist regimes started because of uh, the, the frustration of, you know, the, the income inequality. And I'm, I think maybe something similar could happen again. There's a lot of fear that strong men governments might fill this fill this void. Uh, I don't know. It, it, you know, it, it's easy to be a pessimist here. The biggest economies in the world, America and China, I think, come out of this quite frankly with coming across as a bit, at least to date, incompetent and corrupt. China could have been more transparent about what was going on and saved a lot of lives. Our incompetence, in my view, uh, as a nation, is going to has just resulted in more affections and more deaths than we needed to have. But hopefully the immunities are beginning to kick in and we're starting to, you know, to turn this back and we'll come out of this, whether it's in a year, two years, five years, better and stronger. Um, so, so if you were to give advice to either a 21-year-old or 22-year-old just kind of leaving college and trying to figure out what to do as we emerge from this weird cocoon of coronavirus, or you were t- uh, giving advice to a 45 year old woman just laid off from her, her job wherever. And and it's unclear if that job's ever going to return. Well, what would you say as the, they should focus on and and for rebuilding or for building? That's a really difficult question. I think, you know, I mean, it sounds, sounds weird. Uh, Cut your costs, cut your burn. Um, look through it. Right, because there's going to be there's going to be less consumerism, I think, yeah. too. I mean, we always say, oh, consumerism b- bounces back, but I'm not so sure it'll bounce back so quickly I agree. this time. Cut your costs. Uh, I mean, there's just sort of concentric circles. You got to make sure you're all right. Don't be afraid to ask people for help. Uh, make sure your family's all right. Um, think, think about really cutting your burn, cutting your costs such that you don't put yourself in an uncomfortable situation economically. But beyond that, I don't, you know, uh, I, I don't know. There's going to be a ton of opportunity uh, in terms of niches and new, new industry. Um, but I don't. I wouldn't say I like have a playbook here, a post-corona playbook for young people because we're in a situation right now where typically we welcome four to seven million kids to four-year universities and another two or three million to junior colleges, which are kind of the unsung heroes. That might change dramatically in the fall. So, you know, the, the honest answer, James, is I just, I don't know. I don't, I don't feel like I'm in a position to say to someone, okay, do X, Y, and Z. I think we're in triage right now. I think you make sure you're all right. If you're not all right, a form of courage and bravery is to ask for help. Ask ask for help. I was never, I never had the confidence to ask people for help when I needed it. What would you ask them if you could have? 
Oh, when my mom died, I didn't get on with my life. And I thought of myself as a master of the universe. And I didn't, and I kind of woke up two or three years later post my mom's death. And I was still, I don't want to say a mess, but I just hadn't moved on with my life. Don't be afraid to reach out and ask others for help, whether right now you're struggling economically or emotionally or just feeling depressed or down or scared. I think the ability to reach out and ask people for help such that you can get to a good place and start helping others, I think that's a form of courage or bravery that I did not have when I was younger. So now when I'm not feeling like having a great day, I tell my wife and family, I'm struggling today. And they're really good at adapting around that. And then and then they'll tell me the same. Uh, and I've had, I reached out, I'm now in a position finally in my life where I can get off my heels and onto my toes. So I send out a message to my company saying, does anyone need help? And I, I was blessed that a couple of people reached out to me and said, I, I, I do need help. And I was in a position to help, which felt wonderful, made me feel very masculine and strong. And I know you're not supposed to feel those things anymore, but I like feeling those things and it made me feel great. So I think reaching out for help when you need it. And then if you are in a position of feeling pretty good or feeling strong or in a good economic position, getting off your heels and onto your toes and helping others. It feels wonderful or providing comfort to other people. It's like, for me, it's like about time. And then I think a ton of opportunities are going to merge out of this and hopefully things get back to some sense of normal. But yeah, I don't, I don't think there's a specific playbook other than right now, distancing six feet for the next 14 days. <laughs> yeah, I agree. It's funny. Uh, just to close this off, I do agree that if everybody has just stayed in a closet for the next 14 days, the virus is eliminated from the planet. It's done. <laughs> yeah. It's done. But we, we, we're trying to do it and no one's really doing it. Not, not even in, you know, China or South Korea or wherever. So just humans can't do that. And, you know, I think this gives a lot of food for thought about what this new normal is going to look like. And, and even the conversations around this, what, what those should look like rather than being partisan, start, look at, look at reality, you know, focus on how things are going to get dispersed either to individuals or the big brands. Uh, and there's going to certainly every industry that relies on you being at a specific place at a specific time is going to, is going to go away. <laughs> And, uh, you know, it's going to be very interesting, but Scott Galloway, professor Scott Galloway from NYU, which hopefully will still stick around. I, by the way, Scott, I remember 40 years ago, NYU was not in the top 15 of anything. And it's to the credit of the administrators there that it became such a top 10 school. So that that's to your point about how administrators are still going to have value. Did I lose everyone? So, okay. So the internet is breaking down also. That's the new normal. It's like too many people are too many people are binge watching Breaking <laughs> Bad right now. Uh, I don't know what's going on. No, but this has been happening. Is that but you were on a roll? I think we. I think you were about to wrap us up. Yeah, yeah. So, so I'll start again. Professor Scott Galloway from NYU. Thanks again for coming on the podcast to discuss the new normal. And and by the way, everyone listening to this must reads are the algebra of happiness. Such a great book by Scott. And also in terms of analyzing and and understanding these high tech businesses that have essentially taken over every aspect of our lives. The four, which is about Amazon, Google, Facebook, Apple is such a great book to read and is about tech in general and, and industry in general. And also the Prof G podcast is a new must listen to podcast. And Scott, I think, I think that's where you're going to be. Your empire, your content empire is going to be built on that podcast. Where, where my march for world domination takes over. James, you and I are taking over Australia. <laughs> General Consulate of Australia, James Altucher. Well, I, I kind of want to take, like, Australia feels really big to me, and it feels like everybody in Australia could probably beat me up. I'm thinking more like a Micronesian island, like maybe Tonga or something like that, where I just, Tonga? all I, all I, I need it. to do is buy their UN vote, and and then and then right. I have power. Yeah, at at a minimum, let's just uh, we'll settle for Chipotle reopening, right? Exactly. Well, well, Scott, I look forward once again to to seeing you in person if 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 we ever leave our houses again. And uh, thanks once again for coming on the podcast on the James Altucher Show. Uh, thank you. Be safe, brother. Mm -hmm.